think we're almost live, guys. Okay, sounds good. I think Nicole's still here, but leaving soon. <laughs> it's a very <laughs> nerve-wracking experience. <laughs> okay. Okay, there we go. All right. I think this is happening. We are officially live. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, <laughs> I think we've still got a series fester leaving the room. Maybe I should get like a thumbs up when we're ready to go. Mm -hmm. This is our new virtual world we live in. <laughs> Absolutely. Interesting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, um, we are officially live. Um, welcome everyone to the, who is watching to our first ever Creator Hangout uh, as part of a new series of virtual programs that Series Fest is bringing to you in your living room. And I'm Claire Taylor, I'm the Director of Programming. And um, we're so excited to launch this really special series featuring our alumni um, uh, each, each Creator Hangout will feature our alumni, but tonight's is a special one. We kick it off with our um, season three alumni, Emil Pinnock and Ian Robertson, um, who had a project with us called Up North. Absolutely. Season three feels like ages ago, but no, um, crazy. It, yeah. it was crazy. <laughs> um, so I guess I want to, I guess, Let's download the folks that are watching about up north mm -hmm. and um, kind of where you guys started and where you are now. Um, and I'll kick it over to you. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys for uh, for being here um, and for uh, giving us the opportunity to share our experience with you. We're hoping that it's a rewarding one. But um, as Claire said, uh, Ian and myself uh, produced and co-wrote um, the pilot up north, which we premiered at Series Fest. Um, I also directed and starred in that as well. Um, we pretty much raised the money independently um, on our own and put this thing together, uh, not really knowing much of what we were doing when we started, but I uh, learned a lot along the process. Um, and it was really rewarding to know that there was a place to take it. Uh, we did, didn't know for a long period of time where we were going to kind of like showcase our skills through uh, independent television. Um, and, you know, we found Series Fest last minute and, you know, we're ultimately able to, to go there. We were just really happy to be there and happy to have our, our work uh, be seen by an audience. Um, and then we uh, ultimately ended up winning the Best Actor Award for Ian Duff, which is our lead character. Uh, we won Best Director, um, Best Drama Pilot and uh, the Audience Award, which is a very special award for us as well. Um, with the diverse community that we were screening in, it uh, let us know the power of our content that we have and how we could actually travel beyond the initial community that we thought we were writing it for uh, when we started. And so uh, we finished that. We came to Series Fest, we had no representation at all, like no agent, manager at all. We couldn't even, couldn't get in any room. <laughs> uh, and the press from Series Fest around a project, um, not only just highlighting that we had won the awards because that's part of it, right? Just them updating on like, what was the update of the of the festival, but more importantly, um, them walking through the process of how they curated the content, who they had uh, attending the, uh, the festival is what kind of gave us a bit of credibility to go back to LA. And we had so many different doors open up with for us. We uh, immediately met with all the top agencies um, and ended up signing with a top agency in management and then we took out the project and um, went from the kind of being like the hotshot people who we thought we like having a bunch of momentum and kind of got quickly knocked off of our horses a little bit where we were like, oh, we didn't know the, the pitching process immediately. And so hit a few bumps in the road, uh, but initially took it out a little bit more wide and got a really good feedback. And we end up selling it to Entertainment Studios, which is owned by Byron Allen, um, which was a phenomenal deal because it allowed us to own our project uh, and participate in the, the larger side of the ownership, which was important to us because we owned it when we started it. Um, we just now finished the writer's room. We wrote eight episodes and we were literally, literally one day away from our production meeting, which is 
on a Thursday if I'm right, right, Ian. <laughs> oh, <laughs> got shut down on Wednesday morning. That was it. I don't want to talk uh, about this. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a crazy process because he like all the way to Series Fest, all the way through this. And, you know, the, the Series Fest family okay. knows how long we've waited and the different things that we've gone through so to get to about a few hours away um, from moving forward and going into physical production was crazy. But, you know, things happen. We're happy to be here with you guys. Um, and I, at some point, we'll be going into production on up north and finishing that first season that we got ordered for. And outside of that, um, as we wrap it up, we also signed a deal with Blumhouse where we're writing um, a new television series right now for those guys called Empire on Blood. Um, and then we have another deal on the table that we had just recently got offered over at Warner Brothers on another project that we still have pending right now. It's kind of open, but it's you know still... Um, you know, but the offer is out to us and it's ours to take that as well. We have a project that we have at CBS, Cloud9 Productions uh, for a project called Seventh Guest. And then we also have a potential deal with Quibi right now that's kind of up in the air. So we have several deals that we've closed and a few other things that are kind of, uh, we're hovering around just given the time that we have now, but we're grateful to have went to Series Fest, like we said, literally with nothing and uh, grab all the experience that we have so far, hopefully one important thing could jump out to you guys today. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, I mean, it's been such a great three years knowing you and watching you go through this journey. And um, we are so grateful for Series Fest it has this platform to support artists like you and to bring programming like this. Um, and just a little uh, note on that, we are a nonprofit and tonight's programming is free. We wanna keep continuing to build this and other really exciting community building programs for our creators and for our audience. So um, there should be a little button to donate. I think I could go like this, but it's probably a little further down on screen. Um, and anything helps. Uh, suggested donation is $10, but whatever you feel uh, that you can contribute, and we're so excited for tonight. Um, so I think okay. kind of going back to the pitch part, um, uh, you know, how, uh, do you guys want to pitch up north? Is that, can we hear a little bit about the story of up north? Absolutely. Um, I wouldn't call it like a full pitch because I think in <laughs> our in our presentation, we're going to outline that there's a few deeper things that we want to want you guys to hit, hit on in that pitch. And we wouldn't want to keep you too long to walk you through that whole process of ours. But if we wanted to walk you through, I guess what you would call like an overview of the project of up north, um, up north is very closely and loosely based on some life experience that I've uh, that I went through as a young teenager, being arrested for the possession of two firearms that I didn't have uh, and sent to uh, prison in New York um, until I went to trial. And the experiences that I had to you know encounter um, along the way. And so the soft pitch and overview of our series is as one young teenager who's innocent of a crime in New York City is going into prison for the first time into a world that is radically different than the one that he's leaving. An older inmate, senior criminal, is coming out of prison after serving 20 years into a new New York in a world that has drastically changed. So we have young and old, in and out, and all of the world that they are going to encounter along their journey. And so that's pretty much the first uh, season of Up North is following these two guys in their journeys. And then uh, the subsequent seasons um, we'll follow these new two different guys who are not the same people they were because of the two new worlds that they went inside and see the different people that they become. Is that good, Ian? I, I mean, I, I always pitch it a little different, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> I thought you did all right. I thought you did all right. <laughs> you were going to go to biz, the biz route, the three guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let me do it. No, let me do mine. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Up North is the story of three characters. One is an innocent kid coming out, coming, uh, going into prison for the first time into Rikers Island, the most dangerous jail in the country. And the story of an older inmate coming out and discovering that the guy that he murdered, his son is the most biggest uh, drug dealer in Harlem now. And so now he's facing the fight of his life. And the third character is a street hustler who does a lot of bad things, but you realize he's doing it for a good purpose because he's trying to get his daughter out of child services. That's my pitch. 
<laughs> I go with I go with the three characters, but I always and I. I always yeah. go with the two, but we, we sure. felt that it would be transparent for us to only say, this is kind of the differences in the different pitches, right? We're like open it up with a real authentic experience because we both usually go back and forth on how we like even pitch a series that we stole, which is interesting. Yeah, it's very mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, so I am gonna yeah. hand it over into your hands to walk us through part of the pitch, um, which I'm going to be on the edge of my seat for it because I know you guys have learned so much, um, even mm -hmm. just formulating those two different pitches we just heard. Here we go. <laughs> well, as we jump in, um, we, we kind of walked you through a little bit of our background. And so we just want to humbly say, like, this is just our experience. Um, there are a lot of people that might challenge some things that we say that might have sold things differently. Um, we can only offer what our experience has been. And um, we have been very mindful to kind of like really uh, process and take down all of the different notes and things from our, from our different pitches for our own benefit and so that we could actually share it on platforms like this. And so once again, we're happy for, for serious rest. But like we said, this is not, nothing is uh, gospel here. You know, this is just our experience that we just want to want to share abroad. So um, we break down the art of a successful pitch always in three uh, different categories. And we view those three different places as the people, the package, and the pitch. Um, and so we want to kind of walk through each one of those. Um, I'll start off and then Ian will jump in as well. And so we wrestled with the whole people aspect of it because there was a, an urge maybe to address the people in a different way. And some of the people that we were talking about is like the core team, right? Your team as who's your writing team, who's your producing team, and who are those people that you actually have in the pitch. And then there's the relationship between the representation, right? The agent and the manager, what role do they actually play in the pitch um, as far as helping you to craft that pitch? And then what is their role inside of the pitch? Because they may or may not take a role inside of that. We've had agents actually accompany with us to studios, um, several different meetings in a day, going to meeting to meeting with our agents. And we've had other pitches where we just set up and we don't go with the agents at all. And so they don't have a physical presence. And so we thought about addressing it from that point of view. And then we thought about the executives. How do you target who you're going to pitch to and those different things? And so after a lot of conversation, what we really came away with is that if we wanted to tell um, a beneficial you know, uh, approach to the art of creating a really successful pitch, we thought that the first person that we would address is the individual writer, right? Because we think that's the that is like our major selling point. And if somebody had to ask me or Ian, what was like, what is our greatest strength when we go inside of a room? I think that we would say it's ourself. We believe that people sell sell, sell um, you know shows, not necessarily projects. Like we we know that people want to know about the, the characters. But we, in our experience, we would like to offer to you guys that we felt more that people actually want to work with people that they want to work with. And so the first like P in this whole thing of people, we kind of landed on it is that it's your persona. It's uh, you being able to know who you are as an artist, uh, you know, being re really confident in that. Um, with us, we have a writing team and we call it the Harvard and Harlem pitch. I grew up in the streets of Harlem. I do not have a high school diploma. I have n did not go to college. I am not classically trained. Um, Ian is a, Har a Harvard graduate, so um, when it comes to levels of education, he studied film there, he has that background, and we find it really unique that we're able to bring this really authentic, you know, feel from the culture of some of the places that we tell stories from, and that we are still um, classically trained, and, and, and we have this balance that we kind of go back, and we, and we love it, but that's our brand, and we're confident in that, and, it, and when we go into rooms, into pitches, we know what we have and we are very confident in what we have. We know that there isn't a, a people that, a group that could tell, you know, a story that we're telling um, better than us because we feel like we're better, we're best uh, suited for that. Um, anything you want to add on there, Ian? Oh, of course, he might've frozen. Yeah, um, I, oh. I, I would say, hello, hello, hello. Yeah, hello? I'm listening. We can hear yeah. you. I, okay, um, I yeah. was going to say that you have to think of yourself as a character. Oh. 
Ian, we're having a little technical difficulties. Um, in classes early. Any, any action? Up. Oh. With me? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Coming in and out. Yeah. Oh, this is weird. But... All right, we'll let you try one more time, and if not, I'll take it. I'll can you hear me? I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. Uh, yeah, think of yourself as a character because you know when you write a script in the in the action line, that's actually you as the writer speaking to the audience. So, in in all scripts, you are a character. You believe it or not, like and so. The fact that you're a character, even in a script that's not about you, has to extend into who you are as you're pitching. You, you, you have to be a character. And I mean that literally. Like I, we've written, we, we write our name on a page, we put a dash next to it, and then we describe ourselves. And then we read it and we say, is that character interesting enough? And if it's not, you've got to rewrite that character. Because I mean, I think about most of the, writers that you know who are famous, most of them are characters. There's something funky about them. I mean, there's a reason that George R.R. R. Martin dresses like a sea captain. <laughs> he's, a, he's a character. You have to be a character. And, and once you're an interesting enough character, then you get to go into the room and pitch. And when you pitch, the first reaction, the first thing that you're selling is that character. And once they're interested in that character, then you get to tell the story of the script or the project that you're working on. Absolutely. Um, and just to be a little bit more specific in our pitches, when we are crafting our pitch document that we'll talk about, uh, we always start with um, the personal connection to the material before we even speak about it. Uh, we, we just open up about, we, we are pitching the actual series of sorts, but we're, as we're doing that, we're talking about why it, is something that we wanted to, a uh, story that we wanted to tell and why we're the best people to actually tell that story. And we open up our pitches always with that as, a, as an introduction. Um, I believe now that we've kind of gone through a lot of these different things that most of the studios know that they're gonna change all of this stuff of the show anyway, to be honest, like, yeah, you know what I mean? They're gonna hire showrunners, they're gonna, we, we had a deal at, um, a potential deal at Netflix um, and we, we were going back and forth with those guys for a, a long period of time. I, it was even termed, if you remember, Ian, that we were on the one yard line with our deal <laughs> over at Netflix. Um, and they couldn't find the right showrunner, right, um, with us at that time. And it was like for a number of different reasons. And so, you know, they, they're going to change a lot of different things. The showrunner is not going to agree to things that you, that you want to do. That part about it, they're open to changing the characters, the, 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 the season pitches that you have on the arcs. But what they can't replace is you. They really want to know, do you have the, are you somebody that they want to work with? Are, they somebody, are you somebody that they trust? Do you have within you, do you actually have enough story on this particular issue where they're not going to run out of good quality stories and unique content. I think that was one of the biggest things in our selling up up north. We went in our first uh, sales meeting just to tell you, we spoke about my own experience for four hours. Um, in our sales meeting, the owner of Entertainment Studios, Byron Allen, he wasn't even supposed to be inside of the meeting. They said that he couldn't join us because it was an introductory meeting and it just wasn't a high level meeting at that point. It was for us to come in and meet with his executives. However, he was in another meeting and he went to go to the bathroom and he, they said, well, let's grab him and, to, and tell him and have him come in just to say hello to you guys. And we were so compelling in selling ourselves in that meeting that he didn't leave that meeting until about three and a half hours later. He never went back to the other meeting. He told them that he wasn't gonna step out um, and stayed inside of our meeting as we, as we actually told the story. And what sold the show wasn't the series Bible of sorts. We were the series Bible. And that's what we're really trying to tell you as being the people. We showed him in that moment that I knew exactly what it was like to get dr dragged off of the streets of Harlem as a young innocent kid thrown into a van. I knew what it was like to go to that prison, to go inside of it for the first time. I knew how scared I felt. I know how defensive I felt, but I also knew that I had a choice to stay alive. Or I had to basically, you know, basically come to the idea that I probably wasn't going to make it outside of that prison, especially in the high class classification unit that I was in. I sold them that I knew the other how the other kids felt. I, I, I sold them how we knew how the relationship between the 
the uh, the officers that were there, the lawyers, the judges, the the sentencing. I mean, we told the story so much, so compelling that there was no way for him to question whether or not this series was something that was engaging now, but that could also be engaging for later. And so our biggest thing that we would like to tell people is like, know your content inside out. You know, know that you are the person to tell that story. Know that if they walk away from you right now, they, they're not gonna be able to tell that story. There's no way to actually find your story again. Like it, it has to be that personal um, to you. Maybe there could be another prison story and there obviously will be. There's a, there's that, it's a very you know popular topic right now, but there would never be one that that is as balanced and so specific as the one that we told. And we knew that that was a uh, that was our strong point. And so we we hammered it home. Hammered, like I said, you know, it went for four hours, um, and we left shaking his hand from that meeting, knowing that we could do business with him. I think that that's a you raised an important point, which is you know talking about the Paul persona issue and creating this character of who you are, it's essential that the character that you create for yourself fits perfectly into the content of the show that you're pitching. Absolutely. So that there's a connection of like this story, I'm the best person in the world to tell this story. Because because honestly, most executives would rather hire their buddy executive or you know show mm -hmm. showrunner X that they already know to tell the story. You have to prove why you're the person to tell the story. Absolutely. Uh, you know, like the George R. R. Martin dresses like a sea captain because it says to you, this is a guy who's in his own world. He's he's just out there. And so when he so when he pitches a show like Game of Thrones, you're like, oh, this out there guy, of course, this is the guy who's gonna know more about dragons and because he's out there. In the, in the same way, you know, you you need to be the perfect person for the show. And you know, obviously in our in our case, Emil is literally the, the most qualified person in the world to tell this story. And I'm not really sure why I was even in the room, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and to kind of segue, you know, to kind of support that and segue into to the next part, portion too, is that um, we went to Blumhouse prior to our deal that we have with them now to pitch up North. And we had a phenomenal meeting. I remember at that time, and Ian, you weren't there at that initial meeting, but I remember after that meeting, I had called you and told you that was the best meeting I ever had in my life. Like I had never feel that, felt that welcome. I had never felt like the thing was going that well. Like you can just tell in the room that like you would eventually work with these people. Um, and that's how I was feeling along, along the meeting. But as we got to the end of the meeting, they kind of pitched us a little bit on how to change what we were doing with Up North um, and, and make it kind of fit the Blumhouse, uh, you know, that kind of like horror, you know, if you will, um, mm -hmm. you know, and I, if you know up north is not, it's like a gritty street prison, you know, uh, thing. And we were like, if we, if we put ghosts in the prison of up north, our community is going to kill us, right? So we can't, <laughs> we can't go that far. Um, and so it was, it was a little bit of a difficult, you know, conversation um, to kind of be like, well, that's not really fitting our brand. For one, Jason Blum, what he's done at his company, he's at the top of the list. So, so it's almost like if Jason wants to do anything to your project, you're like, damn it, let's do it. But we had to hold to the integrity of what we actually believe. But what we presented in that meeting was that we were specialists of this community. We were specialists of these type of stories. We were specialists in, in a way that if he ever was going to revisit another project in this way, we thought that Blumhouse would actually remember us because we left who we were inside of that room. And I can tell you that that was true because months later, they purchased the rights to the story we are telling, Empire on Blood, which is a soft pitch to you guys, a story of, and that takes place in the early 90s about a guy who got convicted of a crime doing 20 years in prison for a murder he didn't commit and his relationship with the in, uh, investigator, uh, actually a journalist, excuse me, who, who comes in, uh, researches his, his thing and basically helps him get out of prison after 22 years. And so once they bought those rights, we got the phone call. It, it, they knew that we were the guys. And so one of the things I will say is in pitching and selling your project is yes, you might be, you'll be able to sell your project better when you know who you are and when you own that. And when you have the confidence that's like, you are the only you and you coming in there because you know that they need to be in business with you and it might work on your particular project. But if it doesn't, there is absolutely no way nobody's gonna forget about you if you, if you actually you know, come in with that level of confidence and you come in with the ability to, to show that you are a specialist at that project. You, I believe 
And I can say that with full confidence that you will do business with that person once they meet that real you. That's really powerful, you guys. I mean, the message of even, you know, just being the right person to tell the story, no matter what the genre uh, goes so far. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, as we kind of segue a little bit off of that, just that, that you know, that, that individual, you know, you being that person, um, Ian, do you want to talk a little bit about the package that we take in um, as we kind of segue into that? Sure. Um, so in terms of the package, sometimes you will be told what materials you need to bring. Um, other times they will add, you know, other times you won't know and you just have to guess. Um, generally speaking, the documents that I would suggest that you have are a, first of all, you need to have a log line, uh, which is, you know, a sentence or a few sentences that basically capture your show in its most basic form. It's the classic uh, elevator pitch, elevator if you pitch, will. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the second document is a one sheet. That's basically, it's like a log line stretched to a page. So it's you boiling down your show into a very brief introduction of some of the characters, a very brief synopsis. Uh, sometimes you give a little bit of sense of who you are as the writer and how you connect to the story. But again, it's a, it's a very short document. It's a cliff notes, if you will. Hmm. Next document is a series Bible. Now that is, a, that is the holy grail of pitch documents and of all television projects, basically. Um, people are much more likely to read a series Bible than they are to read your script, honestly. And exactly, yeah. That's a fact. It's more That's important. Fact. And a series Bible, basically, you, you introduce the characters, you introduce the pilot's story, but you also talk about the series as a whole. You talk about the themes, the world, the tone. You basically go through all of that. And those documents can really vary. That, that, that document can be as short as five pages. It can be as long as 40 pages, you know, or even longer, I guess. But Absolutely. Why? You, need to, you need to have some form of that. And then obviously the last thing is the script. Now, you know, I can't tell you that every pitch requires having a script, but you know, my, our, our thought process has always been, if they, if they like our pitch so much that they're asking for the script, I damn well better have it, right? I better have it ready for them so that, so that, so that we can get the sale going right away. So those are the documents that you have to have. Um, no, no, that's it. You want to say something? Yeah, our, our series Bible that we had originally when we sold up north was about what, 45 pages? Roughly? Uh, I think it was like 30 pages. 35? Okay. All right, cool. Um, <laughs> no, but we, but we've seen, pages, that's what it yeah, was. We've, we've actually saw a lot longer series Bibles, to, like just to kind of double back to what Ian was saying. I believe the one that influenced me the most was the one from The Wire. And I think that was the, the largest series Bible I ever looked at. I think it was like 100 pages so sure. close, or close to. Um, but I will say uh, just to kind of, you know, the tricks of the trade is that, you know, make sure it's very engaging. Some people we create the series Bible and, it's, and it doesn't read like your script. You want it to actually really captivate the audience as well. Don't allow it to kind of like deviate from your storytelling version of yourself to where you just start to just provide information and it just becomes like this document that they're reading that they're not really experiencing something. Um, yeah. We try to make sure that no matter, every single page that you're in, you're still getting a bit of flavor of us as a writer. You're getting a little bit of flavor of that world that you're experiencing. That can, that you can do that by using certain dialogue that is still inside of that world. You don't, you don't wanna, you don't wanna tell your story and say, well, inside of my story, the characters look and feel and sound like this my series Bible is only explaining that and it sounds different. It sounds very pitchy and, and just very uh, standard of, you know, it, it doesn't sound like it's taking place in that world. So you want everything that you are communicating in your series Bible to feel very much like you're inside of that world. If it's a lot of, pro, you know, if it's, if it's vulgar, if it's a lot of profanity, then I say pitch your, your series Bible in the same way. They should be feeling like they haven't left that, that exact world. Um, and, and then also, you know, even when you're ex explaining the transition um, from going from like explaining, for instance, let's say we're going from the overview into the tone, right? You want to have that aggressive feel that, you know, 
what what is what is it, well, aggressive if it's our content, but whatever your content is, you want to stay <laughs> within the world that you're experiencing and make sure that they don't leave the world. Um, I think that's the biggest note that I can give you because so many people leave the world of their show to do the series Bible. Mm -hmm. Because now it's like, I'm no longer telling the story. I'm just explaining how I would do this. I'm explaining structure. I'm explaining tone and they leave that world. So make sure that you stay in the world, please. If, you, if, if someone's gonna take their time to open up their script and you got so much amount of, only a certain amount of time to keep them in that world, you better keep them in there turn after turn and page. Um, and I would even say this, I don't know if I, we took it as a compliment. I'm not sure if, if, if everybody would, but people said they enjoy reading our series Bible more than our pilot script. So that was like, that was like a, that was like a big thing that they were like, wow, we love, but like, we got a lot of calls back on our series yeah. Bible hmm. um, after people read it um, because they just felt like they really understood the world. So that's just a, that's just a, a major point that we want everybody to keep. Did you guys ever change your Bible based on who you were meeting with? Like, uh, like ma having maybe one longer version or a shorter version. And also, did you ever, uh, like, what was getting feedback on your Bible? Did you apply that feedback or have to revise things? Or were you kind of, you know, saying, this is it, this is our baby and we're protective over this? I would say, I mean, we've gotten feedback on subsequent Bibles, but the Up North Bible, uh, I don't think we ever got really any significant feedback um, because it was the, probably the most authentic document we could have created. You know, it's, it's just, when, you, you know when you have it right because it feels like you're the only person who could have told the story. And at that point, it's really hard for somebody else to give you notes. Cause it's like, what do you, you don't know what you're talking about compared to me. You know what I'm saying? Like there's that feeling of, of authority that the document has yeah. that, that is coming from your voice. And it's such a specific voice that it becomes like very difficult for somebody to, they can, they can like it or not like it, but they can't really tell you how to change it because it's so, it's so you, you know? Yeah. The more, the more you write from a place of, of, of authenticity and of ownership of the world that you're explaining, the, the less you're inviting people to give notes. You, you know what I mean? If you don't want to be down with it or not, that's cool. But like, you, it's no way you're going to be telling me about what's taking place in this environment and at this place that you haven't been with these characters that you haven't met, that I'm telling you that I'm you know, intimately involved in, whether it was by personal experience or the fact that I've researched this more than anybody else. It's really hard for someone to kind of come in. Obviously, executives will try, but I think that even you you create a buffer between you and them when you really own it in a way and explain it in a way where they can't even weigh in on it. And I think that we did that excellently with Up North. We've, we've even tried to chase it in other projects again, and we were like writing other projects and we're like, you know, but it, it sometimes it's a little bit more difficult. Um, and we've passed on projects like that before because mm -hmm. we feel like, you know what, we're not the guys. You know, like maybe this isn't the best thing for us if we don't have that sense of authority. And then that's another thing because you always feel like you're missing an opportunity um, if you don't take every opportunity. And we've what we've kind of felt is that, you know, with the confidence that we have now, we want to be involved in the projects where we can have that level of confidence and deliver on things excellently and not be those guys that are just continue to chase opportunity that will ultimately give us a bad reputation if we don't deliver in a high quality. And so... Um, and that's easy to set when you have a lot going for you. I think I, I want to be, be careful of that and, and, and understand that some people are like, well, I don't know when that next opportunity is going to come. But I will say protect your protect your reputation. If you are a really talented writer and you work hard, you're going to get you're going to get your opportunity. You might not know what's going to come from. We, we definitely didn't know that we were going to go to Series Fest and change our lives. But we did know that we were going to put the best quality that we could put out there and that we were going to work harder and that we were going to show up. And I think that that same opportunity will be available to you guys if you uh, put the best work out there and not just chase any opportunity. I, th I think also another, another thing um, that I just, I feel like I have to mention is, um, you know, these various documents that there's the shortest to the medium to the longer there. Yeah. It's all about knowing what's important about your show. In other words, if somebody, once you really have your show, like where you really know it inside and out, if someone says you have 30 seconds, two minutes, five minutes, 20 minutes, you should be able to pitch the show, discuss the show, 
And if somebody says you have 10 seconds, you should be able to give them the show in those 10 seconds because it's the same thing as writing. The, the biggest, the largest amount of work you do is knowing what your story really is at its foundation. Um, and so, you know, when you write a log line, then you move up to the one sheet. And then even when you write the series Bible, it's, it's the same thing that even in the series Bible, which is a larger document, you still have to at first express the idea in its most simple form. And then people kind of catch on to that. And then you start to add little bits of detail more and more. But again, it's, it's always about knowing what's the most important information. And then you slowly build in the more deeper, deeper and deeper into the show because the, the, the little secret and what we're probably gonna get into this more when we talk about the pitch, but the least interesting thing about your show is the actual plot of the show. <laughs> when you pitch the show, that, I mean, that's literally a note that your agents will give you. Absolutely. Is stay away from plot. And they're absolutely right. And the, 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 the irony of that is as a writer, that's the thing that you're most interested in. So that's like, that's the first thing that you have to sort of unlearn is that when, when people ask about your story, they don't actually want to hear the story. They, they want to hear everything else but the story. And we, we took a long time to understand that. Remember Ian, we were like, yo, what does he mean? Like yeah. pitch, pitch the story, not the plot. And we're like, what the hell is that actually mean? And like, how does that actually look? It's true. Um, but I, absolutely. Um, for sake of time, you wanna you wanna move forward, and we can jump into the uh, the the uh, pitch, um, Claire. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, well, I think oh, we've yeah, probably yeah. got about ten more minutes, and then we'll okay. take some audience questions. Cool, cool. cool. Uh, the other thing before we go into the pitch, I do want to talk about the other uh, components, uh, Ian, of the package that we might be leaving out because the series Bible could be the end of that. But there's also oh, the yeah. a deck. Um, it's bringing a visual deck. We we believe we we always take a deck with us um, because we believe that the world that we're usually talking about in our series are, are worlds that people don't know about and characters that they might not know what they look like the environments that they don't know. Um, we we wouldn't go to a pitch without a deck, but that's our personal preference. Um, that's just something that that we that we enjoy. But I will say that you have to be very careful if you are going to bring a deck. You don't want to be visual heavy inside of a pitch because they really want to know about the series. They want to know about the characters in that, in that world. And sometimes people rely on, and we've, we've also experienced that as well, where you rely on the visuals is, is so much that you're getting away from the content. And so um, if you have, a, and, and you also have to be careful that you're bringing a really good deck as well, you know, that you're bringing something that adds value to your pitch. Um, because if you're a writer, you know that you can write well. If, if you're now going to get someone else to craft your deck for you and, you know, how good is the illustration? Is it accurate to the actual world that you're talking about? So I would say be very careful to that. But if you actually can find someone that uh, is able to represent that world authentically, um, do so, but be very careful how you use it inside of the fish. Absolutely. Great. Um, anything on the, on a the deck end that you that maybe I'm missing? Uh, no, really. I mean, like you said, don't be too dependent on a deck because we definitely walked into rooms where we handed the deck to the executive and he just put it on the on the chair next to him and he never looked at it. <laughs> right. <laughs> a pitch is a conversation. It's 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 you making eye contact and interacting with the person in front of you. It's Absolutely. not it's not you both looking at something the whole time, which like, you know, that's the that's that actually distracts from the pitch. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Now the actual pitch. Um, we came up with a few uh, tricks of the trade that we wanted to kind of to um, just share with different things that we've done in the pitches and things that we wanted to to talk about. Um, the first thing is the actual pitch. We didn't know that you should come with like a pitch script is what some agencies call it, which is where you actually go and practice your pitch. Um, sometimes with your agency, we do it at our agency. So they, they actually set what's called uh, pitch uh, practice meetings and you actually go and we write our pitch. And so, for instance, this actual pitch document looks like a script. We know that this person is going to open up with this statement. It's going to be passed to this person and this person is going to going to carry it for that. And then we actually know who's going to wrap it up. There is a little bit of flexibility in that, right? Because we were dealing with some people who you don't know they're going to answer the questions. What, excuse me, what questions they're going to ask. 
what answers is going to lead you to if they ask that question. So you have to be very flexible on that and be ready to be quick on your toes. But I think that the pitch script serves for a good uh, guideline so that you don't get wrapped up and you can get back to where you actually need, need to go, um, especially if you have uh, more than one person inside the pitch. Like it's essential. Um, if you are a single writer, that could be a lot, you know, facilitate a lot much, e a lot easier um, because it's, you know, you're relying on, on yourself because it's me and Ian. Um, we've also packaged shows with very big name producers or people who are coming attached to it as IP. Um, we've had probably upwards to, which we probably shouldn't have Ian, but we probably had about seven people in our pitch meetings from our team at certain times, you know, the, the, the bigger the company go and the bigger the projects. And so that could get very, very frustrating. Uh, be careful with that, please. If, if, if you are going to be a writer that they're going to attach those things, those things seem very sexy at first where you're like, hey, I got this big producer and he's going to come. And then I have this, this actor who's going to come and who's going to attach or showrunner and you feel like you have a stronger project to pitch. And then you get to that pitch and you realize it was a disaster. Um, we've been on that side. We've had like the ultimate all-star team that I can tell you right now, we wish we would have went in there alone um, because we never really actually got to the, 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 the basics of a very a strong grounded pitch. Um, so well, practice that pitch. I was gonna say, you, because you lose, you lose the conversational aspect of it when you have that many people. Like at, at the end of the day, a pitch is about you making a connection with the person you're pitching to. And when you have that many people, it becomes everybody sort of sitting there tight-lipped waiting for their turn to talk and at certain, sort of like competing with each other, trying to say it the best way that they can. It just, it, it creates a dynamic that's not natural. Like that's the key, you want, you want it to feel natural. Absolutely. Um, the other thing I would say is do your research um, on who you're pitching to. Um, that's a that's a real big thing. Uh, you know, work your agents. You know, they're some of the laziest people in the business. And if you don't manage their, them, you know, they're not going to they're not going to be doing this work for you. They have six, seven hundred clients who they're lying to every day and telling them that they're doing something for them and that they're about to deliver something. And if you don't demand, and Ian would tell you that I, that this is something that I do all day, I make sure that we get our proper attention and that things are delivered in the way that we um, that we need them to be. And so be confident in that. Um, and that and that confidence is not going to come from like some inner like bully or like you know aggressive behavior. It's going to come from your writing. It's good when you know that you have something on that page and you know it's undeniable. Then you're going to be one. You're going to want it to be dealt with and, and, and handled with care and in the right way. And so sending you in meetings just because they know an executive that they were in the mill room with or because that they, they want to, uh, the, the, the company just wants to meet a certain amount of people for quota is not going to do you justice, right? You want to go in, and, 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 if, you, and if you are going to go in on that way, then go in on a general, right? But if you are going to go into a pitch where you are expected to sell a series, you want to go to an executive who's looking for content in that particular genre, you want to go to an executive who is excited about meeting you, whether that be by way of um, a recommendation from someone else. If you uh, see in your work in, 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 uh, ahead of time, um, be very careful that you prepare your way for a successful meeting. So many people jump into meetings to have them and they haven't really set themselves up for proper success. And so when we learn the art of that, we definitely have had some real, really successful meetings understanding what needs to be, what needs to happen in the preparation of that meeting. I the, think um, the other thing that we wanted to talk about uh, in, the, in the research and for the executives as well is um, if, you, if you don't know what they want uh, bef when you go inside, you can, also, you can also kind of craft your pitch. This is kind of about the conversational side of it where when you go in, there's a little bit of like room that you can have to kind of learn a little bit about them prior to pitching um, so that if you might want to angle your pitch to, to meet some of what they're looking for, um, that, that is just something else that you could pitch. And I'm not saying change your project because obviously we're telling you to be confident in that, but there is a, a point of emphasis that you can make um, on a particular you know, style of the, of the series or a particular arc of the series that might you know, pique their interest more um, than if you actually went in a different direction. But I, it all comes in with doing your homework and knowing who the actual executives are and who the company is. I think, I think also the time makes a huge difference because sometimes you get into the pitch meeting and you think you have an hour, but then they tell you only, you only have half an hour. Um, 
and and whatever the time is that they give you you know you need to leave at least half of it to just have a conversation with him so you might have prepared a pitch that takes you 25 minutes to get through and then suddenly now you realize you only have 10 minutes and that's where knowing your content is so important so that you're able to just mentally i know i know what the important beats are and i can compress it and i can still get through it in that shorter time frame Absolutely. Well, on the sake on a, on that note, we, we're rounding up at about <laughs> five forty five now to, to hey, here we go. Yeah, um, but I'll say the, the last thing I wanted to say really quick, uh, Claire, if that's okay. Yes, absolutely. Um, is uh, which we talked about the 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 the, the pitch, but the the delivery of the pitch is what we really wanted to hit on, and the passion that you need to go in there with. Um, remember that character. Remember that you are a character, and remember that they're looking for that confidence and for that delivery. Um, I just just for a, a short a short story. I don't like having my back to um, doors when I'm inside of them. That is something that I developed being in jail, and unfortunately, I just can't shake it pretty much. Um, but sometimes I train myself to not bring it up because I don't want to make people uncomfortable. But when we sold up north, I would often go into meetings and move people around, and I would love to share that story. That was a part of the introduction to our character. That was to show them. I walked in there as a character and said, because of my prison experience, I'm no longer comfortable sitting in this particular thing. So I want to rework and reframe the whole room. And that was how we would start our pitches. So find your um, opportunities to really go in with that level of passion and, and, and setting up your character so that you can actually like play it out in that scene. Because it, it really is a scene. A pitch is definitely a scene. Let me say, let me say one, one thing, too. <laughs> on the passion note, I got I gotta say it. So, the the way that I was taught this, and and the, what I and I I believe this sincerely is, your goal in a pitch is, and the, at the beginning part of it, you got to make them laugh at some point. Somehow you have to make a connection in that room and make them laugh, and then your goal is that somehow by the end of the pitch you make them cry. Now you can't actually make them cry, but the idea is. You make a you make a strong enough connection that they feel it they feel it in here a little bit at some point, and I right. think those are the two places that you just have to hit. You have to make that real connection, and you have to make them feel it. Amazing, you guys. Well, this has um, been like the fastest hour ever, so we're gonna try and get some audience questions in. Um, and you know, so I'm calling in from Denver. Ian and Emil are in LA. So if you are watching, please comment on where you're calling in from. Um, we want to hear from you, and if you have questions. Um, okay, so the first one is from Tina R, and she is wondering how you change your pitch for some new platforms like Quibi. Yeah. Heavy hitter. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and I think the meal froze. Oh, I, I guess, uh, you want to do you want to take this one? You, no, you got it. it. You got it, and I'll jump okay. in. Uh, I mean, the Quibi thing is a super weird one because it's yeah, like yeah. nobody's writing stuff that's not short usually. So, so we're all kind of figuring that one out. But I mean, it's the same thing of of boiling your story down to what its essentials are um figuring out what the simplest version of your story is um because a good story like honestly like we've been in pitches where we've pitched a show as a half hour and they've suggested to change it into an hour or exactly. pitch the show to be an hour and then they've suggested you turn it into a feature it, it's more about a good story and 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 they'll they'll help you to fit it into whatever box um they have for you to exactly. put it in so i i would say it's not really that big of a deal, honestly. Yeah, I don't think exactly. we changed much of anything at all, honestly, when we went to Quibi. Nope. The yeah. executive that we work with at Quibi, uh, his name is Luke Elson, and he um, says that they're, when they talk about the, the content over there, they refer to it as movies. Um, they don't say short form content or you know quick bites when they were talking to, to uh, content creators. They, they either refer, refer to uh, episodes or, the, or films and then they, they don't even ask you to pitch the breaks or, or the uh, the end of each episode. They just want to know where you're going. And then as you pitch the series to them, they'll go back later on and they'll cut in. And you'll, they'll find those moments. So there's there's no reason for you to uh, pitch it any differently than any other series. All right. 
Um, well, this one comes from Ryan Anglin, who is actually a Series Fest alumni. So shout Ryan. out to all the alums. So what's up? What's up? <laughs> <laughs> um, and this was actually asked a few times. Um, can you expand upon pitching without a plot or the plot? I told you, Ian. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we didn't have. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you want to go? You want me to go again? I'll go again. I mean, okay. we, so you. The issue, here's the issue with pitching your plot. It's like, oh, well, the character, he meets his dad and then they, they find a key in the, in the street and the, it, be, it becomes too much information very quick for somebody to, to, to follow. And so the way you get around that is people, people understand people much more than they understand stories. So in the context of your characters, you can tell most of the story. You know, when we, when we pitched up North, you talk about, oh, here's this innocent kid from this, he's from Harlem, but he plays video games all day. His his mother, you know, doesn't let him go outside. We we talk about all this stuff about who he is, and then we just turn around and say, and then he's he has to go into the, the worst prison in America, and and that implies enough. Like people get the idea of where the story is heading at that point. So usually, it's through your characters that you you have enough you have enough in your characters to introduce just enough of a plot that people understand what the ending is that drives your story i would say okay yeah yeah that makes sense um okay here's another one 1221 entertainment group is asking is there such a thing as going too far on a pitch with props or boards or materials in general oh that's a really good question <laughs> really really good question um We've 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 kind of kicked around that idea often, um, and so if you are going to go that far, you got to make sure it lands. Because if you don't, you are you're in some in some hot water. You're gonna you're gonna have a you're creating a, the potential of a really bad reputation. Where if it, if it doesn't land, they say, well, can you believe that this guy came in here and <laughs> pulled out a gun and or kicked the chair, or, you know, like or, <laughs> or done you know some really some really unique things. Um, and so it could it could it could go left really fast. However, if you own it and if you really feel like you know, and your practice, you know, I think that's where it goes back to the practice pitches. When people are practicing pitches, you you would be able to feel that, right? And especially if you go to people that you trust and people that you know have have been in these different uh, situations, you should never go into the pitch not knowing how things are going to land and how things are going to work. And that's why we always talk about the practice pitch. So I think that that question doesn't even come from us. It really comes from that practice. It comes from really getting and sitting some people down and kind of feel like, how did that land? What did you get from that? And if, and if it really doesn't land, you know, and there's a general consensus that it doesn't work with, you know, just take it out and, and, and go without it. All right. Makes. Well, I, I... Oh, go ahead. At, expand. <laughs> you have plenty of time. Oh, maybe cutting out again. Yes. <laughs> it's always like, is he just being really... I want to add the whole point of pitching. The whole point of pitching is that people are super nervous usually when they're pitching, right? Yeah. I'm not sure if you are you guys still with me. You're cutting in and out. So, um, because an executive, so the danger. I'll, the danger of, of too many visual aids is they think it's a nervous like thing that you're doing to like help yourself get through the nervousness that you're using the visual aids instead of you talking because you're scared to talk. So you have this thing to help you with that. That's the danger. Hmm. That's a really good point. Um, okay, um, moving on to some more great ones from our audience. Um, is the series Bible the same as a pitch deck? Progress for America is asking. So is the series Bible the same thing as the pitch deck? You know, if you can, if, if you can find out the, the, the answer to that, we would love for you to guys to email us and let us know too. Um, <laughs> because it really gets, it, 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 there definitely are some lines that are blurred on that. Um, and, I'll, and I'll be honest with you, it comes from uh, payment, and this is in my opinion. Um, if you are, if if a studios are hiring people to do um, work on television series, and they're and they're asking you to do that, which we're actually doing right now for someone, um, you're supposed to be paid to do 
what's termed a series Bible or a format. Mm -hmm. um, but the way that people get around it is they actually have a lot of uh, high level executives or producers who want to take projects out with writers um, who are up and coming and they will just put together a, a pitch deck or, or, or a pitch document. Um, and that, and it, 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 it was originally introduced as a way to be like, well, I didn't ask you to do a series Bible. I just asked you to do a pitch document, which is pretty much a series Bible, but maybe a slightly smaller version that I could get away with asking somebody to really do. Um, we've kind of done both um, mm -hmm. as well. It always turns out for me and Ian, to be honest, to be a series Bible. We don't really know how to separate it. It just always ends up being that um, ultimately at some point. But what I think the industry is trying to say is that it's a version of a pitch, a series Bible where you can pitch the series with not, it not having to be as extensive. So maybe you don't go as far in the seasons or as deep with the characters, but I can tease this idea to you. And if you're interested, maybe I can then expand on that and bring something that's a little bit bigger later. Is that right, Ian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think the only difference between a, a series Bible and a pitch deck is you might talk about yourself a little bit in a pitch deck, pitch document, excuse me. Um, yeah. Whereas you, you really wouldn't in a series Bible. Series Bible, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so Scott Gabriel is asking, who's also another Series Fest alum, up, uh, how much did your distributor or network ask you to change your first season from what you included in your initial format um, of Up North? And what was that collaboration like for you guys? Um, they didn't ask us to change anything. Um, we changed it. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah, we went back and we changed it. Um, they were pretty. They were pretty good. I mean, and I and I don't know. I I, don't, I kind of feel a little weird saying this because I don't know if this would be, happen all the time. It hasn't happened on all of our projects, but on up north, you know, people really responded to it, and it was it was just something that they just wanted it the way that we originally had it. Um, we wrote up until about four or five episodes of the project being in and through the writers' room and. It just wasn't feeling right for ourselves, and then we actually like went away for like a, a week or two somewhere. We like rented a place, and then we chopped it all down and built it back up. But that was something that we had individually decided to do because we felt like it was really good, but that it was undeniable. Um, and our and our studio supported us. Um, but on other projects, yes, um, you know, you are going to get challenged, and you are going to um, you know have other people who are going to be. Uh, added to the project right now. We work with a showrunner, Alex Metcalf, who uh, show ran on The Loudest Voice for Showtime and just been recently nominated for Emmy. And he's the showrunner on our show at Blumhouse and we're the creators of that show. And so, you know, it's not the same as up north where we're the showrunners and the creators and the directors and the producers. And so we have a little bit more, um, you know, of authority to make those decisions. But um, don't worry about that. I don't think that the executives, just so to answer your question, so that it re refers to the pitch, the executives are, uh, are going to be, um, they, they know that some stuff are going to change. They just want to know that you're able. They want to see your mind. They want to be able to peek inside your mind. They want to be able to meet your abilities. And so be flexible, you know, and be willing to be, um, to, to collaborate and, and to be a partner. But, um, you know, everybody's, everybody's assuming that things are going to change drastically, to be honest. Okay. All right. I think we have time for two more questions. Do you think we can do it? Thank yep, you. let's do it. Um, okay, Britt Johnson is asking, what questions do you find yourselves regularly fielding in a pitch meeting? What kind of small talk should you expect? Small talk is always like the, uh, the introduction of like who you are. Um, and so I think that when you're pitching, be careful that you're always pitching your story, right? You're not there to get a date or meet a friend. And so, you know, some people start to elaborate too much. I think that comes by way of nervousness. Um, when, when, when I was nervous, I, I could tell you start to ramble a little bit more and you start to go in a different way. Remember that you're there to sell your show. Even when they ask you questions about yourself, you can cut the small talk by making sure that you're saying only things that help sell your series. If it doesn't pertain to that, I wouldn't really get involved in that. Um, you know, it's, it's a sales meeting and everything that you're doing from the moment that you walk in the door is going to be, uh, has to help you sell that show. And that's it. All right. 
Um, okay, so let's see, last but not least, um, at what point do you bring up your potential audience or marketing potential, or do you just let them figure that out on their own? Ashley is asking. Yeah, Ashley. <laughs> I, I would say uh, you, that's not your job. Exactly. <laughs> your job is to be an artist and to be passionate about a story. It's not to be a marketing executive. And uh, I think that most executives feel the same way and would be a bit weirded out if you started talking about target demographics and things like that. That's my opinion. And, and you might even handicap yourself because many times I know what up north, we, if somebody would have asked us that question, we would like, we would have had a really, you know, small, um, you know, section of the people that we thought that would respond to the show. And then we went to, um, to, to Series Fest and we had a completely different community than the one that we probably had originally wrote the show. And we were like, oh snap, like all white women like this, this show. And it really was <laughs> radically different than when we left. And we were like, wow, this show is appealing to way more people than we actually, than we actually thought. And so um, leave it to the executives. They, they'll, they'll place it where they need to place it. You know, they just want to know that you can deliver the art like Ian said. Amazing. Well, I'm going to throw one more. I know I said that was the last one, but I know a lot of people ask this when we've done um, Q and A's around up North, but um, of course, how did you get to film in a prison is such an interesting question. And location is a big part of, of what you guys put together in your pilot presentation. So uh, tossing that to you. Absolutely. Well, we shot in the prison that I was housed in uh, when I was an inmate. So when I when I got arrested for the case that I spoke to you guys about for possession of those two firearms, um, I built some really close relationship with many of the people that worked inside of the prison um, and kept some of those relationships and in contact with some of those people over the years. Uh, I knew for a fact that like I, I was going to go do something positive with my life when I left there. I didn't know I would get this far and be doing this specifically, but um I knew that I wanted to do something positive. And a lot of those guards don't get to see anybody leave there and feel like they had a made a positive impact on somebody. And so I knew when we were trying to go back there that it was different. Like it was like one of the things that they would feel positive about. Like, wow, we got somebody who's coming back to prison and not for a crime, but who's actually coming back here to say that they want to do something uh, positive. And so we had those relationships. It was very hard to get inside of it. It was a, a lot of ye yellow tape to accomplish some of the things that we needed to accomplish. Um, and so it was difficult in the process, but it, you know, one, once again, it was, it helped us in our pitch to say, Hey, we not only created this pilot, but we shot inside a prison and we shot inside of a live prison. It actually was the prison that this guy was actually in. So once again, it's everything that goes back to the pitch. And so we knew that that would be a strong point. And plus we thought it was a good marketing story. Um, you know, you can, but your locations, you can build in your marketing. Like we, we built in some of our marketing um, when we were shooting up north, right? We knew that if we could accomplish it in the prison, we hired some guys that I was locked up with in the prison to play a part because it really is a marketing darling, right? When these people start telling articles or they want to bring you on different shows, we knew that that was something that we could actually go back to as well. So be very intentional about all the decisions that you make. Don't make any of them with just uh, an idea of just like, well, I just need a kitchen, right? Think past that, right? What, what, what? Artistically, yes, but you also want to start setting up things for um, the marketing of your show. And, you know, when you're selling your show, when you're going to festivals, just always find unique opportunities to make yourself stand out. Amazing. Well, thank you guys so, so much. Thank you. Um, and if you liked this uh, hour long and really jam packed conversation, um, make sure to follow us uh, at Series Fest for more like this. Um, we're going to be doing these once a week on different creator topics. And we also have some really exciting watch parties coming up. Um, next week's creator topic is going to be a focus on female filmmakers. And we're going to have five female filmmakers from our Series mm -hmm. Fest alum join me for a conversation around gender parity in entertainment. And um, donate, donate. And donate, yes, Please. thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I say that I say that sincerely because a lot of a lot of festivals say that they're gonna invest in the, the community of independent creators and stuff like that. But Series Fest is actually really doing it. Like we I'm proud to be an alumni of Series Fest. Um, I tell my story and Ian's story authentically our lead character Ian Duff is the lead character uh, on several different television shows right now. Our DP, who was the cinematographer up north, 
uh, won Sundance last year as a DP of a, of a feature film and then came back again, back to back Sundance and won again. He had never done anything outside of uh, up north before we went to Series Fest. So our whole crew is very grateful for uh, being a part of Series Fest and they invested in us and they continue to invest in talent just like us. So know that your contribution goes a long way and that's gonna be used accurately. You know, there's no bullshit with them. They're really about independent artists and giving opportunities. And so uh, be a part of that. And you know, we're gonna do the same. Amen to that. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys again. And I'm gonna do a quick shout out to everyone that joined us tonight and our amazing board and our amazing staff. And the Kaz Matthews Fund has been a big part of supporting creators from the Absolutely. beginning of Absolutely. Series well. So much love to Kaz from this. Yes, side. yes. Hey, Kaz. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys. Adore you both. And we'll see you soon. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Bye, guys.